What does Islam teach us about eating healthily? Well, Islam is the kind of religion that recognises the rather obvious fact that body and soul interact with each other. You can't really separate them. And so what we do to the soul, like, for instance, a sudden bereavement, for instance, a drastic shock to our inner system, can have sometimes biomedical consequences. And similarly, something that drastic that happens to our outward form, like losing our legs in an accident or something like that, tends to affect our inwardness as well. We might feel anxiety, we might feel depressed, we might have a different way of processing information about the world. We can't separate the two. And so uh, the task of religion is to uh, improve us and polish us spiritually so that we can perceive the sacred in the world and address the presence of God in the next world successfully. But in order to do that, we can't neglect our outward form. Sure. Uh, and this is one reason why we have so many hadiths, which are the sayings of the Prophet in Islam, which are, are about health and why medicine has been such a respected profession in the Islamic religion until about 300 years ago. Even here in Cambridge, the students at Addenbrooke's would be learning from translations of Arabic texts right. uh, because the medieval Muslim doctors were respected outside as well as inside the world of Islam. So it's very much part and parcel of Muslim culture. I see. So um, you touched upon the, the hadith, the prophetic saying. So that's one thing I'd like to actually ask you about. Let's look at the, the life of the Prophet Muhammad, sallam, peace and blessings be upon him. Um, what was his lifestyle like? What would he typically eat, you know, his usual meals during the day? Uh, what kind of activities also uh, did he partake in as well, physical activities? Uh, could you tell us a bit more about his lifestyle? Well, the lifestyle really of all of the sages and the saints and the prophets of history has been oriented towards higher things. In other words, it's not really about binging at a restaurant and being concerned with fire and foods. It's about eating what you need, as he says in one of his sayings. It is sufficient for the descendants of Adam that they should eat a few morsels which are enough to enable them to remain upright. And if they have to eat more, then it should be a thir third of the stomach should be for the food, a third for drink, and a third for breath. So this is a kind of ascetical principle, if you like, or an unworldly principle. And you find the same thing in, in Christian spirituality, in Buddhism, in, in the world religions generally, that in order to be open and to ref be refined enough to perceive the unseen world, uh, you have to be travel light, as you said. Najal mukhifun, which is a famous hadith or saying of the prophet, those who take little or travel light, as we'd say nowadays, they travel away, they, they, they succeed in their journey. Mm. If we go through life carrying heavy baggage, even if it's just obesity, but attitudinal baggage as well, uh, then we may find it very difficult to take those necessarily difficult spiritual footsteps. So his was an austere life, a life of frequent fasting, a life when for months, we're told, no fire would be lit in his house and he would live on dates and water and perhaps a few gifts of dried cheese that neighbours might give him. Uh, so yeah, a very uh, austere kind of life, but of course that kind of life tends to be associated with longevity people who live in mountains and don't eat modern processed foods and don't become overweight, they do tend to be the ones who make it past the age of 100. So uh, sometimes <laughs> uh, our indulgence in food is a two-edged sword and it may bring us short-term gratification, but in the long term we store up all kinds of medical and also spiritual uh, ailments. Uh, there's always a price to be paid for every indulgence. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, Ismail, for your question. Uh, another one here um, is on a healthy living necessitates a healthy food supply. How would you suggest Muslim communities in the United Kingdom uh, develop a more sustainable and mm -hmm. pure diet? Yeah, I mean, uh, some people are financially challenged and find the organic option too expensive. Uh, but increasingly, Muslims have a certain income and where they can choose what is organic without undue additives, without destructive plastic packaging and so forth, that's the option that they should choose. And this is something that is clearly religiously required. And you do find that when people have switched from sort of artificially reared and chemically uh, altered 
food and they make the switch to something more natural that within a few days they feel much better about themselves. Their sleep patterns are better. It's easier to get up at dawn for the Fajr prayer. They have more strength during the day. Their concentration levels are better. Their memory is improved. It really does make a big difference. So eat less, eat organic, be very careful about the halal, uh, take plenty of exercise. These things can be accomplished uh, quite cheaply. Uh, and also check out the suppliers of uh, responsibly reared uh, food. So there's, I mean, we have a connection with Willowbrook Farm already in Oxfordshire, which is a kind of famous uh, organic halal farm that's been on the BBC and it's kind of yeah. sensational and it's really a successful model. A lot of Muslims go there from over the country if they're really concerned for this aspect of the religion yeah. and they don't trust the supermarket stuff. Uh, but there's other uh, organic halal farms in different parts of the country. There's one in Wales, one in Somerset. And increasingly, I think this is an industry and a sector that people want to get into. Apart from anything else, if you design it correctly, it can be quite lucrative because the market for um, sustainably raised and uh, tayyib halal food is just constantly increasing. Absolutely. I just wanted to also mention about, um, you know, you talked about eating halal, but mm -hmm. also we have to remember that just because... Um, you know, it's not all about eating meat and chicken all the time yep. because it's about having a balanced diet, mm -hmm. it's about moderation. So um, perhaps you can maybe elaborate on that further in terms of it's not always just about just because we can eat meat and chicken or other yes. things like this. It's not no, I mean, that. there are Muslims in Britain who are unhappy if they don't eat meat at least once a day. Mm. Even though they're from countries and places where maybe meat is a treat that you have on Eid or very occasionally and where people probably are living a more healthy lifestyle. Yeah. Uh, so we need to get away from this idea that I have the right to eat red meat every day um, or that I have to have fish every day because that's not what the metabolism requires and uh, it's expensive and also uh, it's against the sunnah because uh, the, the uh, saying of Imam Ali is that man is uh, destroyed by two red things and saved by two black things, al-Ahmaran wal aswadan And the two red things are meat and wine, and the two black things are water and dates. Right. So it was the way of the early Muslims really not to eat much meat, very occasionally, if it's a treat. You know, but uh, generally, the Holy Prophet would not eat meat day in, day out. And unfortunately, you see some people, even some of the well-nourished Mulvis who keep talking about the sunnah, insisting on eating meat even twice a day sometimes and really kind of packing it away while they're talking about the sunnah, which is kind of ridiculous. And then they end up at the age of 50 having heart disease and diabetes and that's what happens. The sunnah is there to protect you. It doesn't have any other purpose. Yes, yeah. of course. I mean, that was, I mean, to us, that's the perfect way of living. You know, we we yep. try to follow the example of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu yep. Alaihi Wasallam. Um, we've got another question here for you, Sheikh. Um, what, does, what do you recommend uh, for those that are disabled uh, who cannot venture out mm -hmm. into nature and are tied to their beds? I feel that these people are often not accounted for. That's a question that we have here on YouTube. Uh, what would you respond to that? Well, nowadays you do have, if you really are you know, bedridden and immobile, nature documentaries in glorious HD, and that's sometimes even better than walking around the park because you can see the snow leopards and some of the wonders of the deep. Uh, it can be really quite impressive. When I was a child, it was kind of th the early days of color TV and you had to struggle a little bit to see the wonders of nature. Now it's more amazing than ever. Yes. Uh, so that is certainly a form of spiritual nourishment. Uh, also sound, I think, that listening to uh, the types of traditional sound of inshad, Quranic recitation that are very traditional, seem to reconnect one to something primordial and to the natural world. And I think that also is a very important source of nourishment for the soul. And surrounding oneself, even if it's in one's bedroom, with, with beautiful things and as many natural things as possible, that's going to be nourishing for the soul. Absolutely, because I, I mean, in my experience, of, uh, since the pandemic started, one of the things that really helped me actually was when I would go to our uh, local science park and there's a nature mm -hmm. reserve in the centre. Yep. And I used to go there quite regularly because I used to find it was so peaceful and actually made me yep. kind of appreciate nature mm -hmm. more than I ever used to. Maybe that's yep. the case for many others as well. Well, the Qur'an 
is constantly urging us to consider God's signs in the way the heavens and the earth are created. And we're instructed to look at the clouds, to the mountains. It's, it's the book of nature, really. Uh, and nowadays in our urban, brushed steel, high-tech environments, we're suffering from what some people call nature deficit disorder. And when we get back into nature, we feel oh, calmer and chilled. Uh, particularly if it's virgin nature. You might have seen the article we have on this mosque's website about virgin nature and what the Qur'an says about it and how healing it is to the human soul. And of course, Muslims have always loved gardens and we have this, mashallah, beautiful Islamic garden here in the Cambridge Mosque that everybody just feels calm when they walk through it. It's a good way of getting into the space of the mosque that you go through nature before entering the, the sacred space itself. Yes. Uh, Muslim gardens are famous, the gardens of the Alhambra, the Shalimar gardens, you know, they're some of the greatest gardens in the world. And perhaps we recall Monty Don's recent BBC series, Paradise Gardens, mm. in three parts, which was all about the world's great Islamic gardens. Even Prince Charles has an Islamic garden. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's absolutely fascinating. Um, well, thank you very much for all your questions. Um, we've had some absolutely fantastic um, questions that uh, Sheikh has been able to answer, so thank you so much for doing that. Um, we are coming towards the end of this program, but I just wanted to ask for the Sheikh, um, before we wrap up, are there any final words that you would just like to share with our viewers? Uh, just something positive and inspirational for them to take away to you. Oh, I mean, we've been talking about nature and how modernity has made us sick despite medical advances and often inwardly sick because we're separated from nature. And it's important, I think, to remember that uh, the Holy Prophet, in the culminating moment of his career, the Mi'raj, his ascension from Jerusalem up to the presence of God, at that extraordinary moment, the angel offers him two cups, two chalices, one full of wine, one full of milk. And the Holy Prophet chooses the glass of milk. And the angel says to him, Hudita lil fitra, you've been guided to nature, which indicates, according to the commentators, that this is going to be the religion which is about affirming nature, about being part of nature, where the form of worship is linked to the rising and the setting of the sun. This is the ummah, the community of nature. And the Holy Prophet, in his very natural lifestyle, is pointing us a way back to overcome modern alienation and the sicknesses that go with us, and to heal us through immersing ourselves in, in the signs of God in the natural world. Thank you very much indeed, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad there. And to all of our viewers as well, uh, thank you so much uh, for tuning in. We really hope that you have enjoyed this program. And uh, just to remind you all, uh, for the latest news and updates uh, from Cambridge Central Mosque, you can visit our website, that is cambridgecentralmosque.org. Uh, you can also find us on social media, so please do find Cambridge Central Mosque on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube. Please like, follow and subscribe. And on there, of course, you'll find all the latest news and updates from Europe's first eco-mosque. Um, but that, it, that is it from us here from today. Uh, from myself, Ibrahim Rahman, I've been your host for today. And from Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, the chair of the Board of Trustees at Cambridge Central Mosque, uh, we ask that you please do look after yourselves, keep well and stay safe. It's goodbye from us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.